Good morning, everybody. It's so good to be here. Happy Mother's Day. It's a great day to be in church. Worship was awesome. Steph, thanks for that great give and take. Uh, my, my wife is the director of the Antioch Kids back there, and so she wanted to make sure that, that I emphasize the need for people to sign up to serve in kids, and it's Mother's Day, so she gets what she wants. So, so please go back and sign up for kids afterwards. It's a great time back there. Uh, but again, happy Mother's Day. I'm so glad to be here. We're not going to do a Mother's Day sermon today, but we are going to hear from the Lord, and we're going to hear what he has to say for us this morning. We're going to kick off a new series. We're going to be in this series for the next four weeks. It is called The Minor Prophets. So we're, over the next four weeks, we're going to take a look at some different minor prophets. We're going to look at four specifically, uh, but this morning we've got a lot to cover, so we're just going to jump right in and go for it. So what are the minor prophets? They're the last 12 books of our Old Testament. So from Hosea to Malachi, those are the minor prophets, and they're minor because of their size. We're not talking about a baseball thing here. This isn't like the minor leagues and the major leagues. Like, like we're going to talk about Isaiah this morning, but he tore his rotator cuff, so we're going to have to call Joel up from the minors and talk, and talk about him instead. That's, that's not really what we're dealing with. These are, all 12 of these guys are, are guys that heard very clearly from the Lord. All of these minor prophets take place around 1,000 to 400 years before Jesus comes. They're all in that time frame. And they're all God's word to his prophets, his messengers, for God's people, the Israelites. Almost 2,000 years before these minor prophets, God chose a man named Abram. He changed his name to Abraham, and he made a covenant with Abraham. All throughout the Bible, we see, all throughout the Old Testament, we see God make covenants with men, things that he's going to do with them, promises that are back and forth. And God promises to bless Abraham and make him the father of many nations. And he promises to be with the generations of Abraham that are to come as long as they follow him. And Abraham has a grandson named Jacob. And much like God chose Abraham, God chooses Jacob. Jacob's name becomes Israel. And thus the Israelites become God's chosen people as he expands on that covenant that he made with Abraham. So throughout the Old Testament, we see God's people in this cycle. We see the Israelites fall into this cycle with God where they're risen up as a great nation, they're risen up as a great people, and then they turn away from God, and then they're overtaken, they're destroyed, they're whatever. Somebody comes in. This happens over and over again throughout all the generations of Israel. And these 12 minor prophets, they all take place during that cycle. They all take place while the Israelites are going through this continuous pattern with God. So what's the purpose of the prophets? Why, why does God speak to them? Well, it's twofold. First, God is creating a vision for the future, for things to come down the road. But he's also speaking into the current things that the Israelites are going through. He's speaking into the situations that they're dealing with in that moment. He's speaking these things to these prophets that are relating to his people in their current time, in their current situations. So in all of the minor prophets, through all these cycles that we see throughout the Old Testament, we see a consistent pattern of three things. Repent, uh, return, repent, and restore. Return. Return to the covenant that God made with Moses back in Exodus, that he would bless the people that obeyed him and that he would curse the people that didn't obey him. Repent, not just all of a sudden start doing good things, but actually turn away from the bad things that you were doing before. Confess and turn away from the rebellious ways. And then restore. Once the Israelites have repented, then they can be restored to the blessing of that covenant that God made with Moses. And so in different ways, we see those three things play out in all of the minor prophets. So what does that have to do with us? What does that have to do with us this morning in this church, in this city, in this place? Andrew has been talking about something stirring in our church. He's been talking 
about something big that's coming down the road. If you weren't here two years ago, or two weeks ago, Andrew's message on his sabbatical send-off, he talked about the big things that are stirring within the people of our church, the big things that are stirring within Antioch Indy, within our body. But he really encouraged us that these next three months, as we dive into this stirring, it's a time of listening. It's a time of diving in and seeing, not just taking action, but diving in and seeing what does the Lord have to say for us, his people, during this season. And really, that's what the minor prophets are doing. That's what the minor prophets are. They're God speaking to to his people, the Israelites, through the prophets, And so what we want to do is we want to dive in and we want to jump in and say, what was the Lord saying to his people, the Israelites, through his prophets, so that we can hear more clearly what is the Lord saying for his people, us, in the here and now? Does that sound like a plan? Can we do that for the next month? Awesome. Go ahead and take out your Bibles. Pull out something to take notes with. We are a note-taking church here at Antioch. When the Lord speaks, we want to remember what he has to say. So we are starting off this series in the book of Habakkuk. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Habakkuk. Uh, If you think that I'm saying Habakkuk wrong, then please don't burst my bubble. Just let me think that I'm saying it right, because I'm going to say it a whole bunch of times over the next 30 minutes. So you can just deal with it. So what's happening in Habakkuk? Habakkuk was written around 625 years before Jesus came. He's he's living in the last decades of Judah, which is the southern kingdom of Israel. And things are not good. All the people have turned away from God. The priests and the rulers have turned a blind eye to the sinning that is going on. They've turned a blind eye to God's laws not being followed. So things are not looking good right now. There's a, there's a Babylonian nation that's on the horizon that's rising up and gaining strength while the Israelites are turned away from God and are struggling. Habakkuk is written as a conversation. I think a lot of times we think of the prophets uh, as being these pictures or these tasks from the Lord, and a lot of times they are. Uh, but this one kind of feels like a combination of two things. In the Psalms, we see, we see a lot of songs or laments or prayers or cries out to the Lord. Uh, and that's kind of what this is. But in the, in the Psalms, a lot of it is the Lord certainly is speaking, but he's speaking a lot through the prayers of the writers. He's speaking a lot through what the writers are saying. But, and then we, we think of the other prophets when we look even at the minor prophets, We think of of that being God gives a word or he gives a task and then you either do what he says or he doesn't and it kind of goes from there. But this is a combination. This is an actual conversation between God and his prophet Habakkuk. So where does this conversation start? Go ahead and stand for the reading of the word of God. We're going to start in chapter 1, verse 1. says, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are in this room this morning. Thank you that you are speaking to us. Thank you that you have something for each of us to hear from you. We pray that you would meet us, that you would open our eyes to see you in a greater way than we ever have before. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, go ahead and have a seat. So we've been, we've been talking about something stirring within our people, within our own hearts. We've been talking about that, but something is clearly stirring within Habakkuk in that passage that we just read. Verse 2 says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Something's building. Have you, ever, have you ever walked into your house, you come home from work or school or wherever, and you walk in, and you go into the living room, and your spouse or your sibling or your roommate, whoever's sitting there, and the second you walk in, you go, what, are you ignoring me? Why didn't you say hi to me? 
No, that's ridiculous, right? Because you got to at least give them time to ignore you. You're not going to just like jump in to that. And so that's what we see with Habakkuk. He's, he's not just jumping in. He didn't just look around and go, oh, that's kind of bad. God, why haven't you fixed that yet? There's clearly some persistence here. His heart has been broken for his people, and he has been consistently crying out to God to return them to himself. He doesn't even say, how many times must I cry for help? He says, how long must I cry for help? Which means that he's been doing it nonstop. There was something within Habakkuk See, these pro- the prophets had, they had this duty. Part of being a prophet was to come and intercede on behalf of your people. That was what they did. But they didn't just have this list that they'd sit down and go, oh, here are the problems I need to pray for today. Check, check, check. It didn't work that way. There was something within him that was able to feel and identify and articulate the problems that were happening within his nation. Have you guys ever heard the song, Hosanna, the worship song? I think we sang it maybe on Easter uh, or Good Friday here. But there's a line in that song that says, break my heart for what breaks yours. For the first probably five or six years of being a believer, I couldn't sing the words of that song. Now, if you know me, you know I love, I love to worship, and I belt it out, even though I'm horrible. I, I just go with, go with it. It's fine. But, but when, when that song would play and we'd get to that part, I would just sit there in silence. Because even in my spiritual immaturity, and even though I didn't have the right view of it, I understood that there was a real power to that prayer. There was something different there that I couldn't handle in that moment. When I said, God, break my heart for what breaks yours, I knew that I couldn't handle if that prayer got answered. So I didn't pray it. There's a reverence that comes with that. And that's the place that we find Habakkuk right now, is he is in that place where he is looking through the eyes of God. He is looking through the eyes of a brokenhearted father. We cannot get to the point of holy persistence with earthly empathy. We have an inherent desire for justice, but we will unsuccessfully pursue it if if we're going through our own strength and our own minds and we aren't set on the things above. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits at the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 119 says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. When we hear the word law, we think of this legalistic, this thing we have to do, but that's not what it's talking about. God's law is God's word. It's his heart for his people. It's his desire for the ones that he loves. Habakkuk lays out here in that passage that we read why he's distraught. There's destruction and violence and strife and contention. But but that's not... Justice may be the thing that he's longing for. Justice may be the outcome that he wants to see. But his heart is broken because God's law has been broken. Because the people aren't listening to God's voice. Verse 4 says, so the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. Before he ever mentions justice, which may be the thing that he's going for, but before he ever mentions it, he says that God's law doesn't, is paralyzed. God's word for his people, his heart for the ones that he loves is paralyzed. And Habakkuk's heart is broken by that. His heart for, is for his nation to return to God. The desire for justice causes action, but the desire for holy reconciliation causes persistence. Does that make sense? What What I mean is this. I have seen a lot of injustice in our world. I've seen a lot of things that didn't seem right, politically, socially, economically. And those things caused me into action. They caused me to do things I voted a certain way, I volunteer and help people, give money to the needy, feed the hungry, all of those, those are great things. And those were spurred by seeing injustice. 
But they're simply just actions in response to circumstantial injustice. It wasn't until I set my mind on the things above and started to see the real condition of the people around me, the struggles, the desires of their hearts, the things that only God can reveal to us. It wasn't until then that consistent petitioning of the Lord became my norm. Seeing my country, my city, my church, my workplace through the eyes of a broken-hearted father was the only thing that could lead to a response with lasting spiritual implications. Every Sunday before church, my, my three young boys and I, we leave 20 minutes early. 20 minutes before we need to, we go 20 minutes out of our way so that we can pray for every church that we pass on the way to Antioch. We go 20 minutes out of the way so that we can pray for every school and every workplace that we pass. We go 20 minutes out of the way so that we can pray for the people in the cars that we're passing on the road. Sometimes we'll pray into the worship songs that we're singing. Lord, awaken our city, awaken these people. Sometimes we'll pray simple Bible verses. In Romans, it says that the mind set on the, on the spirit is full of life and peace. So Lord, we pray that this city would be full of people whose minds are set on the spirit so that they find life and peace. Sometimes we just sit and listen, Lord, what do you wanna say for our church, for our friends, for our family? But I don't say any of this so that you look up here and you say, oh man, he's doing it right. What, man, those kids are great. That family is so faithful. They're so spiritual. I don't say it for any of that. I say it because every morning I wake up and I go to a workplace where people are drowning in the realities of their circumstances. Every morning my eight-year-old wakes up and he goes to a school where God is the furthest thing from the people that he encounters there. I say it because I wake up every day in a neighborhood, in a city, in a country where people are facing an eternity of separation from their creator and they don't even know it. The desire for justice may lead me to meet those people in their physical needs, but only the desire for holy reconciliation will cause me to continually and persistently cry out to God for those people to return to him. And that's what we see from Habakkuk. Long-suffering persistence before the Lord. And what happens? What happens in the midst of his long-suffering persistence? The Lord speaks. It's been all this time. He's been clamoring at the door. And all of a sudden, the Lord comes in with this great response. Verse 5 says this. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe it if told. Habakkuk has waited all this time. And finally, this amazing response from God, God bursts in the door with this great answer to Habakkuk's persistence. Okay, we can take a breath now. It's going to be good. God is doing a wonder in our days. Should we leave it there or should we read verse 6? Maybe we should read verse 6. Verse 6 says, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the bed of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. Well, hold on a second. I've been waiting. God finally answers. But this actually kind of sort of seems like it might not be that good for me or for my people. Habakkuk is about to become a whole lot more relatable to us in this room, I think. God goes on to describe how horrible these people are that he's raising up. But make no mistake about it, Habakkuk already knows how horrible they are. He has seen them, the threat of them looming on the horizon for a while now. He knows how awful this kingdom is, this Babylonian kingdom is that is being raised up. He knows what it would be like for his people to be overtaken by those people. He knows how horrible and merciless they are. And that's why we see the response that we see from Habakkuk. Jump ahead to verse 12. Verse 12 says, 
Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Habakkuk is fired up here. There's a couple of things that are revealed in Habakkuk's heart at this point. The first is that maybe that call for his people to return to God is a little bit more earthly justice driven than we first realized. Maybe his picture of a nation seeing God more clearly was based a bit more on political unrest, uh, maybe a bit more on social norms, maybe it was based a bit more on economic security than we thought it was. Maybe his picture of the Israelites returning to God had a little more to do with people getting their act together than the evil being separated from the holy. Maybe, just maybe, his picture of a restored nation had a little more to do with the kingdoms being blessed than it did with sinners turning to repentance. And maybe, again, just, just maybe, some of this sounds a little familiar to us. I've been having conversations with people both in our church and out uh, about the state of social morality right now. There was a time that it at least sort of felt like we were all heading in the same direction. Even if it wasn't Christ-based or godly-centered or anything like that, there was at least some sort of joint joint path to right or wrong, but it doesn't feel like that anymore. Those loose interpretations of Christian ethics have seemed to go on out the window. Now you can give in to any sinful desire that you want to, and it doesn't matter how it affects you or anyone else around you. The divide between the righteous and everything else has become huge. So that leads to this question, what are we crying out for? What are we crying out for? Are we truly crying out for a return to God? Are we truly crying out for people to choose actual holiness? Or are we crying out for the political unrest to go away? Are we crying out for social justice to be achieved? The middle ground is going away and choosing to stand on and cry out for a return to God is going to be painful and hard. There is nothing smooth or easy about a nation returning to a God that despises sin. We talked about it all throughout Lent. We did a series on it the entire time. If we want to see God to the fullest, then we want suffering. Habakkuk is realizing what he is actually asking for in his persistence, and it isn't pretty. Habakkuk is also realizing that maybe he came on a little bit strong. Maybe his pleas to God weren't quite what he thought, thought they should be. He was pretty passionate about it at first. He was pretty upset with the state of his nation, but now that he has a little perspective, he's realizing that maybe his people aren't quite as bad as he thought they were. Now, rather than just taking this broad scope, he's starting to look at the people on a more individual basis. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? I mean, yeah, Israel isn't perfect, but certainly we're not as bad as those guys. Yeah, maybe we aren't doing everything that we should be doing, but we're doing way better than those people are. Yeah, maybe I'm not walking with the Lord the way that I should be. Yeah, maybe, maybe I haven't submitted my life to him like I should, but I come to church sometimes. I do some nice things. I'm not out there doing all those horrible things that we see in our world lie and steal and murder, all those awful things. I'm not doing any of that. Here's the thing. 
God's standard for holiness is not judged on a scale that is defined by evil. There's no curve to God's grading scale. Just because really horrible things exist down here on the scale doesn't mean that his requirement for holiness is brought down any. We have to stop playing the comparison game. Romans 3 says, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And later in Romans, Paul tells us that the wages of that sin is death. So if, you're, if we're out here and we're sitting on that fence, if we're trying to sit in the middle ground between God and the world, and you're looking around and you're saying, actually, maybe I'm not that bad. Maybe I'm not as bad as I thought I was then you're still facing people and you haven't turned to God. Habakkuk was missing it. He wanted his nation to return to God, but he wanted, it, he wanted the circumstances to fit what his eyes could see. This solution that God gave, this thing, this plan that he laid out, it didn't make any sense. And he made sure that God knew that. But here's, we're bashing on Habakkuk a little now, but here's where we can get back in line with him. Chapter 2 starts with this. I will take my stand at my wash post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Habakkuk has complaints. We know he has complaints. And in chapter 1, we saw that he was persistent in bringing his complaints before the Lord. He continued to cry out before the Lord until eventually the Lord responded. This time, however, Habakkuk has enough wisdom to take a different approach. He clearly has more to say. He clearly has, has more that he could keep coming at God with. But this time, he takes his stand at the watch post, and he looks out to see what the Lord will say. This time, Habakkuk brings his empty jar, and he waits for the Lord to fill it. He says, I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to act until I hear what the Lord has to say. However long I have to wait and see, I will stay at my watch post until the Lord speaks. There is a time for persistence, and there is a time to sit and wait on the Lord to speak. And when we're willing to do that, the Lord will speak. Even after all this complaining that Habakkuk is doing, even all these things that are revealed in his heart, the Lord responds to him. The Lord tells Habakkuk that justice will come to the Chaldeans, to the Babylonians, that just because he's using them as justice for the Israelites doesn't mean that they won't also get justice served to them. But for the first time, instead of just telling Habakkuk what he's going to do, he gives Habakkuk an exhortation. He exerts him, he exhorts him to live by faith. A return to God is coming, but your hope cannot be in your circumstances. Israel has been in this pattern. We talked about it earlier. They've been in this cycle where they raise up, and then they fall away, and then they're overtaken, and then they raise up, and they fall away, and they're overtaken. They've just been in this over and over again since their days in Egypt. So what can Habakkuk put his faith in? That's all he's seen. That's all he can see. And if God's just going to keep that pattern going anyways, why even have this conversation with Habakkuk? The whole conversation is a vision from the Lord, right? So why not just make it like the other prophets, where God just tells them what to write down, just tells them what to say to the people? Why let Habakkuk plead so hard on behalf of his people if God's just going to keep that same pattern going? Why is it a conversation? Well, remember, what are the visions that the Lord gives the prophets? They're twofold, right? He's speaking circumstantially into what they're going through right then. He's speaking into what the Israelites are seeing, into what the Israelites are doing, what's going to be coming to the Israelites in the current generation or in the ones closely after. But they're also visions of things to come. They're, they're visions of bigger things. They're, they're visions of culminations of all these different things that are yet to come. 
They're pointing to something with bigger implications than just the here and the now. They're building to something that even the prophets can't see in that moment. So what do we see from Habakkuk in the middle of this conversation with God? We see a man standing alone on behalf of his people. We see a man crying out for justice to be served while still wanting his people who deserve punishment under the law to be reconciled to God. But remember, this is an imperfect picture of the things to come. So we also see a man who falls short of being able to save his people, a man who falls short of being able to return his people to God. We see a man that when told God's plan for righteous and justice, we see a man who told that the unjust will be, will be used as justice for the just and the righteous, he can't understand it. He questions it. How can a loving God operate that way? The vision of Habakkuk is a conversation because it's a picture of another relationship between God and a man standing alone on behalf of his people. It's a picture of another man who wanted to see justice served while wanting his people who fully deserve punishment to be reconciled to God. It's a picture of a man who saw God's plan for the unrighteous to be used to crush the righteous. It's a picture of Jesus. But Jesus' response was very different than Habakkuk's response. Because Jesus was not just seeing the circumstantial plan that God had in place. Jesus saw the fulfillment of the things that God was calling Habakkuk to have faith in. Jesus saw that through the unrighteous, crushing the righteous, not just the righteous, but the ultimate righteousness, the only one who could be used to save, the only one who could take the punishment that everyone else deserved, through that man being crushed by the unrighteous, God would reconcile himself to his people. Jesus saw the same and even greater pain on the horizon than what Habakkuk saw. But he saw through it, and his response to God, not my will, but yours be done. The picture that Habakkuk gives us, the faith that God was calling Habakkuk into, was Jesus. Jesus' death and resurrection was the only thing that could break this horrible pattern that the Israelites were stuck in, this horrible pattern of God's people falling away and returning and being raised up and then falling away. Jesus' death and resurrection was the only thing that could bring restoration to God's people. This whole conversation between God and Habakkuk is pointing us to the one true Savior, the one hope for redemption and restoration. So now with that picture, what is Habakkuk's response to God's call to faith? He responds with a prayer, but the first 16 verses of this prayer aren't what you would think. When you hear, when you hear God speak and reveal all those things, then you go, oh, okay, I'm good now. Blind faith, no more worries, no more troubles, we're all good. But Habakkuk spends 15 verses describing the majesty, the sovereignty, and the righteous anger of God. So much so that in verse 16, he says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Habakkuk is still circumstantially terrified. He now has the faith for the things to come, but that doesn't mean that he's just ignoring the way that his people are rebelling against God or the righteous rebuke that God is about to pour out. Yet I will quietly wait. Those things are still happening, but his faith is secure. 
Habakkuk responds to God's call for faith by declaring his trust and fear and reverence for the Lord. And eventually we see him get to this place that we haven't seen from him yet. Starting in verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength, he makes my feet like the deer's, he makes me tread on my high places." Habakkuk responds by giving everything of himself to the Lord in the midst of his circumstances. He responds with faith in the things to come no matter what his eyes can see. He responds with his own version of not my will, but yours be done. Will you stand with me as we close this morning? What's your response today? What is your response this morning? What are the areas of your life that you're responding to the things that your eyes can see? What are the areas of your life that you need to turn your vision to the things of God? Do you know the one this morning that stood all alone on your behalf? Have you given your life to the one that took the judgment and the punishment and the justice that you deserve? Do you want justice or do you want Jesus? If you don't know him, today is the day. Come and pray with somebody. We're going to have our prayer team come up and we're going to do another, another song. I'm going to go ahead and close by praying for us. But if you need to respond, respond. Do whatever you need to do. If you need to get prayer, get prayer. If you need to come to the altar, come to the altar. If you need to stay in your seat, then stay in your seat. But don't let your circumstances control your response anymore. Today is the day to turn to the Lord. Let's pray. Father. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your endless pursuit. Thank you that in the midst of whatever we're going through, in the midst of whatever we see around us, you are bigger and you love us and you chase after us. We pray that you give us more vision. Meet us right here, right now in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.